So today, here's what we're gonna do. Kind of in honor of our anniversary, we're gonna start a brand new series talking about how do you actually form a healthy church? Well, what is it about a healthy church that can make it healthy? I mean, what can I do as a leader? What can you do? What can we do together to make sure that Church on the Hill is a healthy church? And here's the premise of the whole thing. Healthy churches are led by healthy leaders. And you might be thinking this like, so this is a message for me. Well, there's leaders at every level in, in this. There's leaders that are working with kids right now in a classroom. There's leaders on our elder board. There's leaders over ministry. There's a person, Kristen Gordon, who supervised the Star Wars slipper delivery of 15,000. That was not 1,500. That was 15,000 slippers. And I really thought she would honestly give me a pair to model this morning, Just, but she didn't. Leadership deeply matters and healthy churches are led by healthy leaders. But our culture today, I believe, has a problem. And our problem in our culture is this, like, what do you want in a leader? What's the number one most important quality that you are looking for in a leader? If you're electing a president or you're looking at a Fortune 500 company or you're running a small shop or you're looking at the leadership of a church, what is the number one quality you're looking for? I think in our culture, it's this. It's trust. You want to know that you can trust them, that what they say, they mean, and what they mean, they will say that they're going to be transparent and honest and, and forthright with you. I, I think the struggle that we have in our culture today at every level and every place about trust has been well-earned by our culture. Because when you listen to the news, when you listen to anyone say anything about who they are as a leader, all of us in the back of our minds are questioning, are they spinning the truth? And do I trust them? Now, I will say this, I wanna be really clear. Not every problem in an organization, be it a church or a business, is because there's poor leadership. There's a lot of levels and there's a lot of people involved and problems can show up anywhere. But I will stay, say this, healthy organizations don't just stumble on being healthy. They have healthy leaders at every level in the organization. So if we're gonna build a healthy church, here it is. Healthy leaders must build trust through integrity. Now, if you're taking notes, open that up. You're gonna fill in the blank. I have a lot of notes this morning, okay? But I will tell you this, I'm, I wanna put this on the bottom shelf and try and keep it really simple. Uh, today, we're starting a new series in the book of Titus. There's only three chapters. There's only 46 verses in the entire book of Titus. It takes the average reader about 10 minutes to read the whole letter that Paul writes to Titus, which means this, it'll probably take us about six weeks to teach through it, okay? Just so stay with me. In this letter, Titus, who is a young pastor, He's given this assignment. Titus, I want you to build these churches. I mean, they've already been launched by someone else, but I want you to go through and I want you to create healthy churches on the island of Crete. Someone else already started the churches. You just got to go and help make them healthy. And I, I was just thinking about this. I, when I read the Bible, I just kind of imagine things I'm like the island of Crete. That's like a part of the Greek Isles. This sounds like a sweet gig. This sounds like if a church in Hawaii calls me up as like, uh, Pastor Scott, we have an opening for a lead pastor. We'd love for you to come. That will be the call of God and I will be saying goodbye. <laughs> I'm just imagining, this is like Titus's experience. I'm imagining a lounge chair on, on a gravelly beach on one of the Greek aisles with a blue ocean in front of him as he ponders his message for Sunday. And uh, you would think that that's kind of a sweet assignment. Um, but there's a problem there. The island has a cultural problem that has two sources. Here's the first source. The first source is this. In chapter one, verse 12, so if you got your Bibles open, you're gonna need a Bible, okay? Open up, open up. There's some in the chairs in front of you. Towards the back of the book is Titus. 46 verses, three chapters, you'll miss it. So just keep finding it. Find Titus, okay? And have your notes. Here's, here's how the island, the culture is described. 112 says, one of their very own prophets said, Cretans, people who live on Crete, I know it sounds terrible, like Cretans, right? 
Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Literally, if you called someone a Cretan, you're calling them a liar. The culture on the island valued lying to each other, which meant this, you couldn't trust anyone. Now, here's the second source of the same problem of trust. Um, Guaranteed, there were gonna be some Jewish converts on that island. Let me tell you how the Jewish converts grew up in the Jewish system that Jesus describes. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus describes the leadership of the Jewish people this way. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example for they don't practice what they preach. He, he straight out calls these guys, he, he will later on say, they're like blind guides. They're telling you where to go, but they're blind. And then he calls them flat out hypocrites. The culture of Crete is hypocritical and hypocrisy is the opposite of integrity. And we need integrity to build a church that you can trust. Now, if Titus is gonna build this church, it's gonna take a lot of work. Building this church and a healthy church by healthy leaders, that's what chapter one is all about. Now, there's a lot of content in the nine verses we're gonna talk about right now, but I'm gonna try and put this on the bottom shelf. So I really, honestly, when you walk out of here, you just need to remember three things. Here we go, ready? Say, healthy leaders. Say, align themselves with, that, that's it, that's what you have to remember, okay? Healthy leaders align themselves with, and I'm gonna give you three things that if you're a part of this church, that I want you to align yourself with so that whatever level you're at, you are a healthy leader. The first one is this, healthy leaders align themselves with the mission of God. And this is where I get this from. So if you've got a paper Bible in front of you, I'm gonna tell you, underline something, here we go. Paul, a servant of God, underline the word servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ to further the faith, underline faith, of God's elect, and their knowledge of the truth, underline knowledge, that leads to godliness, underline godliness, in the hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie, by the way, that's so interesting, God who does not lie, the very problem on the island was, and he's saying, God doesn't lie, you can trust him. He promised before the beginning of time, this eternal life, in verse three, and which now at, his appoint, at this appointed season, he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me, by the command of God our Savior, to Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Savior. Paul begins this letter with this. I'm a servant. That's all I am. He doesn't describe himself as a leader, even though he knows he's a leader, but he says a leader is actually a servant because healthy leaders are not actually in charge. God is. Christian leaders are simply servants of God who serve the needs of the people in the church. So make note of this in your notes. Servants, what does that life look like? They sacrifice to follow God and further the mission. Um, I've been working as a pastor for 30 years now. It's crazy. Um, three decades, and I will tell you this, it is wonderful. It is a wonderful experience, most of the time. <laughs> But I will tell you this, there have been incredible sacrifices because every pastor will make sacrifices. And it's not just every pastor. Every Christian leader makes sacrifices. There's a group of adults that are leading our middle school right now up there. And they're sacrificing, experiencing this. And they're gonna watch it later on online and they'll be able to watch and kind of experience it there. But listen, watching online is never quite the same experience as being in the room. Sorry, everybody online, I'm just being honest. We all make sacrifices. It, it, the sacrifice that Paul is talking about, it's, it's interesting, when I talk about myself making sacrifices as a pastor, I will never make the sacrifices that Paul did because it will not be required of me, probably. Uh, Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 11. He writes about the sacrifices he's made. He's being beaten multiple times, whipped multiple times, shipwrecked, stranded in the ocean, in danger of his enemies. But then he writes this phrase, it's so interesting. Uh, let me quote to you. Beside, besides everything else, 
I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. And I, I'm just going to tell you this, how I, I think it, and I, I'm pretty sure this is true. You will never know what it's like to pastor church unless you've done it. What is that daily concern? It's that concern of, man, are they getting it? Are they actually following Jesus or are they just attending on a Sunday? It's that concern of, man, why is that marriage falling apart? Man, why are those kids that they have going crazy? God, am I actually leading how you want? God, why are they arguing? God, how do I, how do I help them grow? I mean, I can't make anybody. You promised that you'll make them grow, but, but how, what do I do as a pastor to facilitate that? God, what more can I do? Everyone in leadership, in Christian leadership, will make a sacrifice to be a leader. And the problem is this, is often that sacrifice can wear you out if you're not careful. Burnout is rampant among pastors. So I will tell you this. You want to see 175th anniversary, 180th anniversary? It will require you and I together leading this church because it's not about a lead pastor of a church. It's not about a board leading a church. It's about collectively leaders at every level leading with integrity and building trust. But I, I will tell you this, be careful because it can wear you out. Um, my point is that when you see yourself as a leader of a church, are you willing to make a sacrifice? Now, you might be thinking this, like, okay, this seems to be about Timothy, who's going to be the pastor. And so you've already tuned out. You're like, this just doesn't apply to me. It's like my third Sunday here. And like, I'm just checking this place out. Like, well, well welcome. Just know what you're in for if you stay. Because this isn't just about pastors. And by the way, I'll say this. Pastors are meant to lead by example, right? Which means this, every pastor needs followers, which means the followers, the character that we're about to talk about applies to every Christian. Um, so servants, sacrifice to follow God and further the mission. So healthy leaders align themselves with the mission of God. Here's Paul's mission. I had you underline some words, faith, knowledge, and godliness. What Paul's saying is this, I wanna help increase people's faith. The faith means belief. But faith is more than belief because faith always leads to action. So it's helping people ask the question, if I believe this, how then should I live? If I believe this, how should I act? I want to help them apply the scriptures, put the Christian life into practice, which means this, I have to also increase their knowledge of God's word. If we're increasing faith and increasing knowledge, it's going to lead to godliness. What does that mean? It means it's people who are living out the character of God. And Paul's like, that's my mission. But here's what's awesome about Paul. He not only knows his mission, he understands his purpose. And his purpose is the why. Why would you sacrifice for that mission? And it's because of this. He says it's because of eternal life. Like, like God promised it. That for those that claim Jesus and their followers of Jesus and they walk with him, they get to experience a brand new life today. And at the end of this life, you get to watch as those people are ushered into an eternal life with God. Listen, that's what makes the sacrifice worthwhile. What Titus is about to step into on the island of Crete is not gonna be easy. Ministry is never easy, but it's worth it. See, Paul, Titus, myself, and a bunch of you who've been around here for a long time, you have a front row seat to experience and watch life change in other people. Have you ever seen it happen? Have you seen it happen when the spiritual light bulb goes on in someone and they finally get it and they realize the thing I've been pursuing all my life is empty? And my life is broken without God. And what they finally realize is what they're craving is to be loved. And then they hear that there's a God who so loved them that he gave up his son, Jesus' life on a cross so they could be forgiven, so they could be fully embraced in God's family. Have you ever watched that happen in someone's life? And they turned from bored or disgruntled or angry or broken to finally feeling loved and filled with joy? Have you watched it? That's worth it. And Paul, I think, sets up Titus in this situation to say, you know what, Titus, it, it, it's going to be worth it. So here it is. Healthy leaders 
align themselves with the mission of God. And I hope you know your mission to lead people, to know who Christ is, that you're gonna live in such a way to display the irresistibility of Jesus so that their lives are transformed. Here's point number two. He says, the reason I left you in Crete, this is verse five, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished, meaning somebody else launched the church. I just want you to put them in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed. So Titus's first assignment was this, appoint healthy leaders that in the scriptures here are called elders. But this is gonna be hard. It's not gonna be easy because you're gonna appoint elders, people with integrity, people they can trust on crazy island because on crazy island, everyone lies to each other. So Paul decides to do this. He, he makes a list of all the qualities of what's required in an elder. So I'm gonna say point number two like this. Healthy leaders align themselves with the goodness of God. Now it might say this, you might think this, right? Like, oh, align myself with the goodness of God. So God's good, he wants to give me good things. Sign me up, put me in line for that. This is not what I'm talking about. When I talk about align yourselves with the goodness of God, it's this. God has been good to you. He still is good to you. His goodness is about his character. When you align yourself with the goodness of God, you are putting your character in alignment with God's character. Titus 1.8. I think this is actually the key to this. It says, when he describes the elders and the qualities, he says, one who loves what is good. Do you love what is good? Meaning God is good and that's his character is good. So therefore, do you love God's character so much that you're gonna emulate it? But we have this problem, okay? Here's the problem. Most people try to define goodness on their own terms. I wanna define my own character because I'm gonna define it by what I'm good at. And the things I'm not good at, I'm gonna leave that off the table. Like I really struggle with this. So this is gonna be my goodness over here because the thing I'm not really good at. And so like, I'm gonna pick what my goodness is so I can determine what my own character is. Are you with me? We all do this. Here's what's crucial. Goodness is defined by God's character and not our culture. Because there might be some moments, there might be some moments where God says, hey, hey this in the scriptures that I've revealed to you this is the kind of character I want you to have. And there might be some people that you hang out with at the office in your neighborhood and they're like, listen, listen, who cares? That's not really character. Because listen, listen, can't you just put the pause break, the, like the pause button on character on Friday night and bring back your character on Saturday? Right? Like, I, I, I know, the, the, those are your relationships. Can't you just do whatever you want? It's like your relationship, Right? And your culture is going to give you total permission to you just establish whatever boundaries you want. And God's like, no, no. If you know my goodness, my goodness is actually for you to follow because I'm good to you. So in the midst of this, do we align ourselves with the goodness of God? Because here it is. If you do that, it's actually good for you. It's actually the life you crave. You want to represent his character because there's a sense of honor in it. Not only is it good for you, it will be good for your family. It will be good for you at work. It will be good for you in your relationships. Align yourselves with the goodness of God. Now, side note, <clears throat> I don't want this to derail us, but I got to speak to this for just a moment. In this passage, Paul defines the qualifications for elders in a church. Now, there's all kinds of leaders in the church at every level, okay? They have all kinds of leaders in the New Testament church. But you'll notice that as I read these, this refers to elders, and they only refer to men as elders. So in the near future, I'm going to do this. I'm going to come back to this concept as to why the Bible speaks to only men as elders I can't deal with it today because it's gonna require at least one whole message. And if we do that right now, you're gonna miss the rest of what's in here. But I do wanna state this so you know what our position is. We believe that the Bible describes the role as elders as unique to men. This means that the lead pastor of a church and the elders of a church are reserved for the position of men. And I know this, that will sound countercultural to some of you. 
which is why I, I have to do a teaching on this later on. I, we won't have time for it today. But I don't want us to miss the rest of what Paul is about to say here. So don't let that derail you. I just want to make sure that I state that up front and we can ask questions and talk about that in a, in a previous message coming up. So let's take a look at this. It begins with this, aligning with God's goodness at home. Here's the text, verse six. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless. Blameless, mentioned twice. And you're like, well, who's blameless, right? I mean, that sounds like you gotta be perfect. It's not. It's actually the word. It means that that person must be unimpeachable. Now, come on, in our cultural, political climate today, it's kind of funny, right? Can be impeached that they live in such a way and demonstrate their character in such a way that he's saying that they actually disqualify themselves from the role of being elder because of the consistent way that they betray the goodness of God. So here's the standards. You ready? He starts by this, faithful to his wife. Now, it's interesting because the Greek, when you read it, it'll say this, a one woman man. Now, the word for woman and man, the word for woman can also mean wife. And the word for man can also mean husband. So it either means a one woman man or a one wife husband. And this has tripped up a lot of churches and a lot, a lot of people. I'm, because what happens is this. Christians start creating matrixes of like, well, what about this situation? And what about that? And what about that? Let me just give you a couple examples. What does it mean? Did, can an elder never be divorced then? Or maybe this is a statement about polygamy. You know, you just get one woman, one wife at a time. I mean, is it a statement against polygamy? Like you can have five wives just as long as you have them one at a time. Then the, what, what, if, what if he can't, what if he's divorced? Can he then not remarry? Can he still be an elder? Because then he would have a, a second wife. Do you mean only one wife at a time? Or what about if he gets divorced before he was a Christian? What if like 20 years ago he got divorced and then like 10 years ago he got married and then five years ago he got saved is he still, shouldn't he be an elder? Do you see the matrix that's going on? I actually respect people who try to do that because they're doing it with the greatest intentions of like, I don't want to violate God's word. I really want to follow God's word and do everything I can. Um, let me suggest this. I think what Paul is writing is this. And by the way, the NIV made a translation on this. It's like, they're trying to say, it's about being faithful to a woman, men. It's about being faithful to a wife, I'm going to suggest that elders need to have a consistent track record of being faithful to their wife. He's a one woman man. And each leader, each candidate to be an elder, their situation is going to be unique. And so you should look at this and say, has this man been faithful to his wife? The matrix, I don't think is actually very helpful. And I think each situation should be vetted on its own. The scripture goes on to this, to say this, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Um, the concept's this. You're gonna lead God's family. How you lead your family at home is how you're gonna actually lead God's family because you can't change who you are. So the question becomes, if you're not leading your family well, why would we entrust God's family to you to lead? Now, parents, please hear me. A wayward, wild son or daughter is a parent's greatest pain. Sit on that. I know some of your stories. I know how you still agonize over this. And parents tend to blame themselves for this. And this scripture is not designed to heap on the guilt on you. This is why it's here. I think if there's a wild child in the family who doesn't follow Christ, it's simply worth asking the question, what happened here? You know, I have seen really godly parents. That's some pretty wild kids. And I've actually seen some pretty wild parents have some godly kids. I think this is here to simply say this, 
what's happening at home in the marriage and what's happening in their parenting. Because if, if there's a dad who's like, yeah, all my kids, they, they follow Jesus, I would ask the question, how did that happen? What did you do to train your kids in the way of Jesus? If he's like, nothing, I didn't train them. They just kind of turned out that way. I'd be like, not a leader. Even though he had obedient kids. But, but the dad who has this wild son or wild daughter not following Christ, living this totally rebellious life, I'd be like, what happened? Did you train him in the way that he should go according to the scriptures? Like, did you train him in the ways of Jesus? And they're like, well, no, not really. We just, we handed him to the, the middle school ministry, right? That's their job. I'd be like, uh-uh, not a leader. And yet someone else might say, yeah, I, we've trained them. Listen, we prayed with our kids. We read Bible stories together. Like we talked about, we, we disciplined them. Like, and yet they rebuked, they re rebelled against that. It's worth asking the question, what's happening at home? Because what's happening at home is gonna be brought into the leadership of the church. And once again, we try to create these great matrixes of like, well, what if this and what if that? I think each situation is unique and you have to vet it to say, is that man leading in his home? Now, Titus then gives the not list. He's like, listen, don't be like this to be a healthy leader. Verse 7b, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Ask this question, what drives you? Are you driven by power? You actually have control issues. Like you just got to control people and control everyone and control the situation. That may, will make you overbearing. Are you driven by emotionally overpowering people? Does your lack of emotional control create you to be quick-tempered? Are you driven by your emotions? Are you driven by alcohol? You're like, nah, I know I probably shouldn't, but you know, I don't know how, I just end up doing that. Are you driven by bullying? Are you driven by success or image to the point that you're actually willing to do things for dishonest gain? Those are all red flags indicating spiritual growth needs to take place. What it means is if you're like, you know what? Yeah, yeah, I don't qualify. You're like, I don't qualify right now. I want you to hear that. Because this kind of list, man, you can kind of beat yourself up over this and be like, man, I'm, I'm terrible. I'm not even going to the leadership summit because why would God make me be a leader? There's certain things in there that, man, I'm, yeah, maybe I could be impeached. God is not done with you yet. I'll come back to that. Aligning with God's goodness in our community. Listen to the rest of the list reads this way. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. See, it's interesting. It's not just about reputation at home. It's reputation in the church community and the wider community. Here it is. Hospitable it means you welcome strangers. You're welcoming to people who you might not know. You welcome them into your home. You're generous towards them. One who loves what is good. Again, this is, I think, the key verse. Do you represent and reflect the goodness of God? Someone who's self-controlled. Um, I hear sometimes people will say this. Listen, my culture, like whatever that might be, like my culture is just in our blood. It makes us crazy sometimes, you know? Like, you know what cultures I'm talking about, right? I mean, those Canadians, they get crazy sometimes, like... It is not in your blood, but it may very well be how your parents raised you. Yeah, you raised, you were raised by parents that screaming and yelling and a lack of self-control in the home. You're just emulating the behavior. It's not in your blood. You learned that from them. I will say this. Everybody is born with weaknesses, and maybe your weakness is self-control. Controlling your mouth, controlling your emotions. Can I just say this? Don't allow your culture or even your family of heritage to be an excuse for not getting better at this self-control. Uh, upright simply means honest, fair, just. It's the, the difference between favoritism. Holy. Now, holy, listen, this is not like the holiness of God. What it means is simply this, that you desire purity in your life. Disciplined. Is there some kind of self-restraint that you have over your decisions? So here's a review. Healthy leaders align themselves with the mission of God and the goodness of God. Third and final point, it's quick. Here we go. Three, healthy leaders align themselves with the word of God. Here's verse nine where we're gonna end. He must hold firmly. Get a grip on it and don't let go to the trustworthy message as it's been taught for two reasons. Number one, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine. Second reason, and refute those 
who oppose it. Can I tell you how churches make mistakes in picking elders? They pick people who are successful at business. Or they people pick people who are financially successful. We don't do it that way. Why? Because neither one of those actually qualify you to lead a church. We want to pick people based off of the standards that Paul writes to Titus here and ask each person, like, how do you qualify for this? What are the things that you're concerned about? And remember, blameless doesn't mean perfect, because if that were the case, you wouldn't have any pastors and you wouldn't have any elders at this church. This is more about the character of a leader that is fueled by knowing God's word. Now, in knowing God's word, I want you to understand this. Um, there is going to be moments where God's, words, God's word disagrees with the people around you. Will you still keep a tight fist on God's word and hold on to it? Quick example. I mentioned just 10 minutes ago our view on elders pertaining only to men and that position being reserved only for men. I guarantee you in our culture, I will probably be called misogynistic, oppressive towards women. It's okay. It's okay. Because I'm doing the very best I can to read and interpret through a proper hermeneutic, which means how do you interpret the scriptures and say, God, how do I follow you? And if I don't teach this, even though it, some of them like, oh, can you, why would you say that in church? Like, well, it's in there. Let's talk about it. Because it's not meant to be bad. I don't care if the culture doesn't understand it. And I will not cave to the culture. We want those kind of leaders who are willing to follow God's leadership at whatever cost. So God's word is held firmly as our authority. Now, two ways to hold it, though. How do you use it? Primarily, it is used to encourage people. When someone comes to you and says, hey, I've got this problem, how do you encourage them? Well, how much of God's word do you know? So you'd be like, you know what I think God's perspective is? It's this. And it's used to encourage people. Can I say this? Uh, if you find people who know God's word, but they are convinced that their spiritual gift is the, the spiritual gift to rebuke everybody in the name of God's word, find more friends. Because the reason encourage shows up first there is because that is the primary use of God's word. Encourage people. But there will be moments that Titus will have to confront the culture on Crete. And what did it say? Refute those who oppose it. Leaders, you will have to correct people at times. Second Timothy states it this way. The word of God is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Can I speak from personal experience? It's hard. It's hard to correct people because we get triggered. Parents, when you correct your kids, do they ever trigger you? And you're like, well, why? Because I said so, right? When, other, when adults say things, like, why do you do this? Or, like, they're behaving a certain way, and you're like, that is actually not of God. To correct someone is so countercultural today. But to speak the truth in love, guys, it's hard. That's why we need spiritually mature leaders who are aligned to the mission of God, who are aligned to the goodness of God, and who are aligned to the Word of God. Let me finish with this thought. When I read this, I feel small. I want to shrink back because what comes to my mind is all the ways that I failed this at times. I mean, if I have a track record of failing this, then yeah, probably shouldn't do what I do. So I don't know if you're like me, that when you read this, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't qualify. Look at me. Right now, you might feel unqualified but God is not done with you yet. Parents, you got a wayward kid? Before we end today, let's pray for him or her. God is not done with them yet. Let him reach them. You feel like if you had a series of broken marriages or broken relationships in your past, listen, you can't go back. 
but who you are today. You can stand in God's grace and forgiveness and say from this day forward, I'm gonna be a man who's faithful. It's a flag in the ground moment for us to receive God's grace and love and forgiveness and determine the kind of men and women that we want to be. He's not done with you. Don't leave discouraged. Leave forgiven today. Don't leave disappointed in yourself, but leave with a renewed conviction to be the man or be the woman that he's called you to be. And we'll pick this up next week. Let's pray. God, we need you. Your standards are good. And I believe your standards are high, God. They're not impossible. But Lord, I stand before you as someone who needs your grace and forgiveness. Because there's moments where I fail at some of these. But Lord, I pray that across this room, there's grace and forgiveness sweeping through the hearts of people, that you're not done with them. And you're not done with their families. You're not done with even their past failures of redeeming those things. God, would you bring hope to people in this room right now? But Lord, would you empower us to live with your goodness and your character? And if you want that, would you simply agree by saying amen?